Good morning. And welcome to the first committee meeting for the Natural Resources Subcommittee in 2020 session. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Delegate Edmonds for having steward, uh, stewarded uh, this subcommittee in the past, and I look forward to working with all of my colleagues uh, this year as we continue through session. Um, so I think we're going to get started very quickly because we have some members who have an 8 o'clock committee meeting, and I want to say hi to uh, folks who have joined us on live stream as well. Um, yes, live stream. Uh, so, uh, Delegate Adams, would you like to present your bill first? House Bill 1074. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, HB uh, 1074, I'd like to uh, offer a line amendment. Uh, move the amendment. On line uh, and I don't believe that I have something to pass out, so... Um. Uh, what, one second, Delegate Adams. We need a second? Second. All in favor of moving the amendment, say aye. 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 Delegate Adams, you may have the floor. Uh, would you like me to read the line amendment, or would it uh, be better for... Council. Council. Council, if you could, please. Madam Chair, for House Bill 1074, on line 27, where the text reads, Disturb... The first of the two amendments would be to add, with intent to harm, after the word disturb. And a similar amendment on the second page, on line 103, after disturbing, we would add, with intent to harm. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair. Delegate Adams. Uh, this is a very simple vernacular change. Uh, the word molest over time has become to mean something very different than uh, its original intent, was, which was more in line with the word disturb, and now has a much more sinister uh, meaning in our culture. Um, so this simply updates uh, the vernacular uh, toward the intent of disturbing with harm. Um, because as part of this, there was uh, the capacity to molest a bird or an animal or a nest with a permit, and uh, I don't think anybody wants to be convicted of molesting an animal, nor would they want to get such permit. So this will update the vernacular so that uh, our code reflects today's language. Thank you, Delegate Adams. Are there any questions for the patron? Um, Madam Chair. Delegate Keem. Thank you, and I apologize, this is the first time I'm reading the bill. Uh, would the council repeat the uh, line amendments once again? Because I'm sorry, I didn't. I just, I just wanted to make sure we have line 27. What was it again? Madam Chair, on line 27, after the word disturb, the amendment would be to insert with intent to harm. And the same amendment appears on line 103. After disturbing, the amendment adds with intent to harm. Uh, uh, Madam Chair? Delegate Keem? Following up on that, and this might be a question for counsel and or the uh, patron, replacing the word molest with disturb in those two instances achieves what you want to accomplish in terms of using the right vernacular. I get that part. But when you have the words with intent to, you're adding a mental rea, a mens rea, which is a mental state that you have to have in order to be culpable. That's a criminal standard that we don't have in the ag code right now. Would that change the burden of proof from, I guess this is department of, what is it, gaming, but whichever department they would have to enforce this, would adding the mens rea add another enforcement obstacle that we don't have in the current code? Because that's a significant change. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Ryan Brown. I'm the director of the Department of Gaming and Inland Fisheries and look forward that's to working right. with the Yes. Great. Remember from years ago, we worked on lots of issues together. Great. Thank you. Um, Please, Director. Yes, the, um, this is actually a criminal statute. It doesn't read it on its face, but all of your uh, game and inland fish laws are misdemeanors for violations, so that already exists. I think the, the amendment offered by the patron simply clarifies, when you say disturb, well, this morning I walked by the bushes in my front yard to get in the car and there were some birds took off, and so they were disturbed, you know, not to get through any wrongdoing by myself or any ill will just because I happen to walk past them on the sidewalk. And so I think uh, what, what she's attempted to do here is 
achieve the same substantive result as the existing language, and we would implement it the same way, just using a, a more current terminology. And to be clear, we have no position on the bill. I should have stated that from the get-go. Uh, Madam Chair, just quick follow-up on that. Delegate Keem. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation. Uh, being the farmer from Vienna, I should have known that this was a, <laughs> the ag code includes criminal intent. I didn't realize that. I'm so I'm sorry that I didn't know about that part. But I, my concern is just to ensure that the mens rea aspect, which is the mental the mental state you need in order to be culpable. So exactly to your example, if I walk by and I accidentally disturb something, that's one thing. If I walk by and say, oh, I want to go and mess with these animals and I intentionally do that. That's the intent and the act combined is what, what makes a criminal conduct, criminal conduct to be culpable. I don't know where the other references to the criminal codes so I can't see in this bill, but you're assuring us that that mens rea standard is not changed just because we add those words in here because in your other reference that you just had about the criminal code, that is the standard process for enforcing. If that's the case, I'm comfortable with it. But if that's not, I just want to ensure that we're not creating a new legal standard for enforcement that doesn't exist in the current code. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, we certainly can take a second look at that, although the, the existing word there, molest, and the old understanding of it in, implied an in, in intent. Um, and so I think what she, she's functionally doing here is putting the definition of the old term in rather than using the single word. I'm uh, sorry to be uh, nitpicky, but in that case, can I ask one more? And this might be a friendly amendment for the purpose of drafting this section right. Right now, you... Oh, let me go back. The current bill, which is the current code, says to destroy or molest. The word molest has that mens rea in it, if you want to add that, or if you want to think that. But by changing from to destroy to to destroy or disturb with the intent, et cetera, et cetera, the, uh, the council, would the words with intent only apply to disturb, or would that also go to, to destroy? So to the extent that we want to be absolutely clear, maybe we'll switch it around to say to disturb with intent, et cetera, or to destroy. That way, the destroy part doesn't add a new mens rea, but the dis disturb part does. Does that make sense, Scott? Madam Chair, that does make sense, and it would prevent the intention element from ambiguously applying to the word destroy. Madam Chair. Yes, Delegate King. If the patron would be open to my friendly amendment, that's how I would suggest that we rewrite that code, and our very good counsel could figure out the wordsmithing. But I think the idea here is to make sure that your bill does exactly what you want to do without creating any more concerns or any more. Uh, and in a big, bigger sense here, in this building and in the next building over, the last thing I need is somebody on the uh, particular committee or a subcommittee saying this has a criminal intent, therefore we might want to take a look at it. We'd, like, we'd rather deal with this in the Agriculture Committee, so it goes straight to the House floor instead of going through another committee, if you... Madam Chair, right. Delegate Delegate Keem, I appreciate the suggestion, and uh, if we could fix that here today, I, I would very much appreciate that. Council, could you please read the um, suggested amendment, and then we can vote on that. Madam Chair, the amendment would go on line 27 after the word to, T-O, and it would read, disturb with intent to harm or destroy. And the same amendment would appear on line 103. It would read, for the purpose of disturbing with intent to harm or, oh no, I'm sorry, there's no instance of it there. That would remain the same. Only the first page would be amended. Thank you. Do we have a motion on the amendment? I, I moved, so. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment has been moved. The committee operates by motion. Move to uh, we have a motion to report. It's been properly seconded. Um, the clerk will allow us to vote. Those who vote in favor, please vote aye or yay. Uh, clerk can close the roll, and this bill passes 7-0. to zero. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, Thank Delegate you. Adams. Delegate Robinson, House Bill 1272. Good morning. Good morning. So House Bill 1272, the idea was brought to, forward to me by one of my constituents. Um, he's 80 years old. He's a long, lifelong hunter, and he wanted to um, me to ask for um, 
a lifetime pass for someone who is 80 years old and above to include bear, deer, your general license, turkey, um, for a fee of $200. Now, we went through a couple of reiterations of this because when we compared Virginia to other states, other states go down as far as lifetime passes available at the age of 65. But our Department of Inland Games and Fisheries, that's their, their income is what they make off of the licenses for fishing and hunting. So that became very damaging to them very quickly, not so much in the first year, but the following years. So we, we decided that this would be where we would take it, 80 years old, um, and at, at a fee of $200. And that's the bill in its entirety. Thank you so much, Delegate Robinson. Are there any questions for the patron? Matt. Delegate Weber. Um, we have no position on the bill as it's written. I think the fiscal impact on us is $10,000 or less per year. Delegate Plum. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would have a question also with the department as to whether or not 80 years old do we have people out in the woods with guns 80 years old? As, as a senior member of the committee, I would ask. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, in, in fact, we do. And, and uh, in this past year, we, we actually lost um, one of our, our great senior citizen hunters, Mr. Clyde Roberts, who hunted up until the age of 105 years old successfully uh, and, and actually made uh, national news for his exploits still out in the woods at that age. May we all be so fortunate. So there are there are a few. Uh, Delegate Robinson, I had a question, and maybe the director can also help to clarify. I thought <laughs> might as well just stay here. <laughs> I thought the the way line twenty five reads um, a hunting license and bear comma deer comma turkey license. I thought currently there is a bear license and then a I think it's deer slash turkey license. So are you proposing? To combine this as one license, like one license for our seniors over 80. Um, Madam Chairman, actually, you're correct. Those are separate licenses. Now, um, we would understand the existing language to include both of those two, but you could you could clarify the language as a, a basic senior resident lifetime hunting license and bear. I'm trying to think of an artful way to put it. I think it would be uh, yeah, bear, I, comma, deer. I think the way it's written in your on your website is deer slash turkey license, but that. I don't yes, know if that's how could, it's written in the You could certainly code. do that. Um, I, I think we understand the language either way, but, but those are two licenses, not one. It's two licenses, not three licenses. Yeah, it's bear and then deer slash turkey, as, as the chairwoman was saying. Council, do you have advice? Madam Chair, I would be reluctant to put a slash in the code. <laughs> but, um, slash is what you do to the turkey. I, oh, <laughs> I would recommend leaving it as it is, okay. unless Director Brown really would like us to alter it. I think as it is, we understand exactly what the intention is. And, and since you're including all right. three species, functionally, they're all getting in there anyway. Yeah. Are there any other questions for the patron? Oh, uh, Delegate, oh, yes, Delegate Plum. Uh, Madam Chair, I would again uh, make a comment with a question to the uh, department. You depend heavily on the fees. I mean, that's how you, that's how you sustain your department. And while any one of these that comes in uh, has a minimal impact, collectively they add up to be a chunk of change. And I wonder if, uh, for example, down this list, do we have some other exceptions? Because a lot of people are always looking for ways to get out or around the licensing requirement. I understand you don't have a, a position on this, but collectively together, these deferments and... Uh, Special licenses cost you money. Uh, Madam Chair, they certainly do. And, and Jay Lark recently completed a study of the department this past fall where it was noted that Virginia has the largest number of license exemptions of any of the states that they surveyed, um, which are, are 
all created in code. Um, we do depend on non-general funds. The licensed dollars that we sell are, are how we fund our programs for all wildlife, not just the, the hunted species, but um, the, the species that aren't hunted as game as well. And so, uh, yes, every, every exemption, every special license does come out of the department's bottom line, that, that there's no general fund dollars that, that replace that. That is true. I, I did some math uh, along those lines, Delegate Plum, and I, I think it's, um, you know, a resident senior citizen hunting license is $9, a bear, a resident bear license is 21 a resident deer turkey license is 23 and if, so those alone are $53, so the, it takes 3.7 years to add up to 200 so somebody who's 84, I think, and who, who has longevity, like the hunter you mentioned, I think that's where you start seeing your revenue loss after four years. Delegate Weber. Yeah, so I guess this is a question for the patron. So this is really just to kind of have a um, lifetime fee for the various species, right? Is yes. that why we list the species in the bill? Yeah, we listed the species because there's the general license and then it breaks down and like... Um, um, Delegate Tran mm -hmm. just said that, you know, the bear license is a separate fee from the deer turkey license, you know, so, so we just lump those together and that's, and so th that's where the $200. Thank you. Madam Chair. Oh. Delegate Keem. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just clarified, the lifetime is for the license holder, not the animal. Obviously, <laughs> but that's uh, that's another story. Uh, the question I had was at the end about the internet uh, in terms of sell be sold through the internet. Other provisions in that code section does not reference to the purchasing on the internet, and it sounds like it's the only option. Where it says and shall be sold through the internet. Is there a reason why we're limiting it to just the internet, especially for some of our elder senior citizens who may not necessarily want to do things online as much as maybe some of the other folks who have. More spend, spends more time on the internet. Just curious. That's a great question. I'm not sure I have an answer for you on that. Um, I'm not used to having great questions before 8 a.m. So. Enough. Can, can, can you repeat your question? The question is, if you look at the the end, and there's, <clears throat> again, no harm to the bill, mm -hmm. but on lines 29 to 30, it talks about the license being available, uh, sold through the internet pursuant to section 29. No other provisions in that code section talks about licenses being sold through the internet. I'm just wondering what the reason was for, and, and Scott might be able to share insight, insights on this since he's our whip counsel. Whip snap. Uh, Madam Chair, it's my understanding that all of these licenses can be sold through the internet, and the fact that this one requires it to be sold through the internet doesn't preclude it from being sold in paper copies. Okay. It's just that if you look at line 29, it says, and shall be sold through the internet, which means, of course, it can be, but shall makes it seem like that may be the only way. And because it's so out of, out of line with the other lines, I just wonder if that raises any red flags that we don't need to. Maybe if you change shall to may oh. on, on line sure. 29 there towards the end of the the line. As a practical matter, we offer our licenses yeah. both in person and through the internet, mm -hmm. um, and that's how we continue to do so. So if you, you put May there, that would give us either option. At least we'd be in line with code. Or, or Madam Chair, to be even more consistent, just drop that line. Because if it, and, and I, th I agree with Scott that there's nothing that precludes or requires. And so by raising the issue of selling through the internet, it just makes it seem like we're treating this differently. Our goal, my understanding from the patron, is to treat our senior citizens in the same way, just give them this particular benefit, but otherwise everything else remains the same. That's correct. So if that, I, I, again, I normally don't amend bills before 8 a.m. this many times, but <laughs> it, uh, I just want to make sure that we're not doing anything inconsistent with current law. Not so sure. Delegate Weber. So would the delegate propose striking the language that says, and shall be sold, through the internet percent too, and leave the license shall include any special license. So, um, okay? Council, could you just please clarify for all of us the proposed amendment we are discussing? Madam Chair, the amendment would be at the end, near the end of line 29, and it would strike the words and shall be sold through the internet pursuant to section 29.1 32. 
327. Do we have a motion on the amendment? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion has passed. Delegate Edmonds. Madam Chair, uh, just this is basically the new sportsman's license that, that everybody else can buy for 100. I'm sorry, question of uh, Ryan. Um, that everybody else could buy for 100 now, correct? That would now apply for a lifetime for seniors? Uh, Madam Chair, it's a little bit different, uh, Delegate Edmonds, in that th this includes just your basic hunting license and bear deer turkey license, okay. which I think was the concern of her page, uh, her uh, constituent. So it, it wouldn't include the archery muzzle loader and right. other things that come with your sportsman's license. And this would be a lifetime license, not a annual right. license. And Madam Chair? Yes, Delegate. As a, as a as a point of interest, my, my daughter was actually with the 105-year-old gentleman when he killed his last deer. <laughs> you should share and, the uh, picture. It is pretty cool. Delegate Plum. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, am sorry. It's early morning time, and I get a little grumpy early in the mornings. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, we're, and I appreciate the intent of the patron, and I don't want to question that at all. But the fact of the matter is uh, the agency depends upon the fees and so on. And my concern is if we start down this road making more exceptions to the fees, we don't know what the next one's going to be because it also has merit. If I was 80 years old, and I'm not 80 years old, but if I was 80 years old, I'd do the same math that you did, and I'd have to calculate how much longer I have to go to get value out of this $200 deal, and I'm not sure there's a whole lot of value in it. So again, with all due respect to the patron and the intent of the bill, I would move that we gently lay it on the table. Is there a second? Second. I did not hear a second, so I think that motion fails. I move to report. Second. All those in favor of moving to report, please say aye. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, thank you for opening the roll to vote. Move to report as amended. Uh, the clerk may close the roll. And the vote is six to one. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. that. And so does my constituent. Uh, Delegate Walker, House Bill 1307. Morning, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, this bill before you is uh, to, you know, we have uh, hunting laws, publications that are put out every year by the uh, Department of Game, uh, Inland, and uh, Fisheries. Uh, what I'd like to include is a what we call a novice book, How to Hunt. So for those that are beginning uh, to enter uh, hunting, uh, either at a youthful age or at a later age in life, this would be basically, these are the ABCs of how to go about you know, hunting. Um, this bill uh, that I submitted uh, did have some uh, amendments to it, so if council would like to update the members regarding that. Madam Chair, we have a substitute at your desk, and it shortens the bill to just the first existing code section and inserts some new phrases and strikes some language. Can I have a motion to move the substitute? I move the substitute. All those in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> the substitute is now before us. Delegate Walker. Okay. Thank you. After discussing this uh, with the um, Department of Game, Inland, uh, and Fisheries here, uh, instead of ad adding additional cost to their budget for publishing another uh, uh, publication, we go to sporting goods stores, Walmarts, whatever, and we see the uh, annual book on fishing regulations, hunting regulations. We're all used to that. I mean, we've been uh, sportsmen for many years. So without adding additional costs, I was agreeable to having, in the language here, electronic app. Since we're all connected electronically now through our iPhones or whatever, then this could be another 
form or a booklet that could be an electronic form, which will not be incurring any cost to the department at all, but it still be accomplishing the same thing for those who were seeking the information on how to hunt, then this would be available to them. Are there any questions for the patron? Thank you, Delegate Walker. Yes, Madam Chair. Delegate Weber. I guess this would be a question for, for Ryan in order to implement the bill. Would it just be another little section on the Go Outdoors Virginia app? I believe that's correct, Delegate Weber. It, it would be, uh, but th this bill would give us the, the authorization to include it on the app or a separate section in, in the printed digest, which really is consistent with what we're trying to do to recruit new hunters, anglers, and wildlife enthusiasts across the board. So I, I would agree with what the, the patron says, no additional burden on us. All right, thank you. Delegate Plum. Uh, Madam Chair, I would also have a question to the department as to whether or not this uh, provides for you to do anything that you now cannot do otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, no, it doesn't. There's nothing that would preclude us now from including this information. This would uh, just be in, in, a, in a way of a sense of direction towards us, but, but actually work that we're already doing in order to, to, uh, to attract new licensed purchasers and boat registrants, which, as you very astutely mentioned earlier, are the sole source of our funding. For, further question, Madam Chair. Delegate Plum. Do you have on your staff people who... Uh, are experts in publicity and news announcements and website development and all that sort of thing. You have the people who are currently experts on that on your staff. Yes, we do, and it's it's a growing area. Fish and wildlife agencies across the country are coming to realize that the social sciences are as important to our future as the biological sciences are, and that we need to reach people. And so, we recently hired a public information officer, um, and we have social media folks these days, and and other marketing type staff who put these types of publications together for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Plum. Are there any other questions for the patron? The committee operates by motion. Move to report. Second. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are there any comments in favor of this bill from our audience? Got a thumbs up. Are there any uh, who oppose this bill? All right. The committee operates by motion. Second, second. Uh, the clerk will open the rolls. Oh, Delegate Plum. Uh, Madam Chair, again, all well intentioned what we have here, telling a group of people who we hire as experts on our staff, the code already is kind of thick. And to continue to add to the code that which the department can already do, seems to me to be a bit superfluous. Thank you, Delegate Plum. Okay, we're going to open the rolls. All those in favor, please vote yay. I will close the rolls. The bill passes seven to one. Thank you, Delegate Thank you, Walker. Madam Chairman. Delegate LaRock, are you ready? House Bill 1357. Madam Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Are we at eight o'clock yet, Mark? Uh, Ms. Delegate King. Um, members of the committee, House Bill uh, 1357 is a very simple bill. It would modify the code regulating the sale of game and fish mounts. Um, this was brought to me by a constituent. And um, <clears throat> first call was to D DGIF to ask if there was any concerns uh, related to the, the effect this would have if passed. And um, I guess DGIF can speak for themselves. But my understanding is that there was not. Uh, so the proposal would amend this to allow residents who own a mount that is legally taken in Virginia to be exempt from the limitations that are put on the sale of a mount. So effectively they would be able to sell them out uh, that was legally taken in Virginia. So I would point out that the effect of this would be, for example, if 
Um, Delegate Webert's wife wanted to declutter their living room while he was away in session and sell a couple mounts. She could recoup a small portion of the taxidermy costs. <laughs> Another way of looking at it might be that if someone wanted to um, make room for a bigger mount, if they harvested a larger deer than they did last year, again, they could uh, transfer that to someone uh, and there could be uh, money exchanged for that. So not to make light of an important uh, bill, but uh, that pretty much sums it up. Be glad to answer any questions. Uh, and Ma Madam Chair, Go ahead. excuse me, um, there is a line amendment. Oh. Uh, so having explained this um, at the recommendation of uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, we uh, have a sub, excuse me, a line amendment that would add fish. And uh, if the clerk would uh, perhaps uh, explain that. Council, if you could please read the line amendment. Madam Chair, the amendment to House Bill 1357 would go on line 31 after the word mounts, which is stricken. We would add the words or fish so that that line would read a wildlife or fish mount that was legally taken. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion on the line amendment? So Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, questions for the patron, Delegate uh, Weber. Um, I guess my, my question is why would such transfers be illegal or why were they illegal in the first place? Because my wife would love to declutter our house. <laughs> she keeps trying to get me to bring them to Richmond. And that's... Uh, Madam Chair, Delegate Weber, th those prohibitions date to the... the desire to uh, avoid commercialization of wildlife that, that really led to the foundation of these agencies a hundred years ago. Um, the idea was back then that we, we didn't want folks harvesting a trophy buck for simply selling them out or, or the antlers. Now over time that's been tweaked by regulation and by code to the point that now you can you can sell a deer mount currently um, by regulation, you can sell turkey parts by uh, an action that the General Assembly instituted a number of years ago. And as you see in the bill in front of you, an, an auction house can sell anything that they want to. Um, so this bill, I think, really would, would just kind of clean up the remaining items that, that are left that haven't been covered by prior action of either the General Assembly or our board. I think that the key operative phrase in this board and in, in this bill is legally taken um, because that's really what those laws were intended to guard against was poaching for sale. Thank you. Other questions for the patron? Is anybody from the public would like to speak in support of the bill or in opposition? All those in favor? Oh, so sorry. Uh, the clerk will open the roll. Those, uh, if you vote in favor of the bill, please vote yay. All right. <laughs> Clerk, uh, and the, uh, we'll close the rolls, and the bill passes 8 to 0. Thank you, Delegate Thank you, Barack. Members of the committee. Thank you, and uh, Mrs. Weber, thanks you as well. Um, so we have two administrative items on our docket. The uh, patron for House Bill 1188, Delegate Wampler, has requested that we strike his bill Yay, from our docket. So moved. That, that's a recorded vote. Okay, so that's a recorded vote. So the clerk will open the roll. If you support, please vote yay. And the bill is stricken, 8 to 0. The uh, patron for House Bill 1282, Delegate Hodges, also moves that we strike his bill from Yay, our docket. So moved to report. <laughs> and uh, if you vote to support to strike that bill, please vote yay. <laughs> and that bill has been stricken from the docket 8 to 0. Delegate Weber, are you ready? Okay. House Bill 963. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, let me kind of describe the, the situation that brought the bill um, 
the idea of the bill before us and um, what the bill seeks to the problem that the bill seeks to solve. Um, essentially, so in Culpeper, Falk Year, and Rappahannock, particularly, we've got um, an overabundance of black bear that have um, just our po the population continues to grow. And what is happening is during the course of the summer, um, a black bear, when they enter a cornfield or a crop field, uh, sorghum or, or corn, um, they go in there. And if you can picture a panda bear in um, uh, bamboo where they're pulling it down and just eating it and causing all kinds of problems, they'll go into a cornfield and destroy literally acres of corn. Um, and, huh? Yeah, well, these are big panda bears, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and so what, what is happening is they're literally destroying, uh, destroying the crops. There's lots, of, there's lots of them. Their numbers keep increasing. Um, at one point, I think it was a couple of years ago in Fauquier County, we were the number one county um, for bears that were harvested during the season. Um, and what has happened in really the bill is really just to kind of give clarity to, uh, the, posi to the position for a kill permit for a farmer. Um, we've had folks that have tried to apply for them, um, and when they go to apply for the, the kill permit, they're told that they can't because they're in the process of harvesting that field. Um, and this is just more to, the, to guide uh, BDGIF and, and clarify that in, that, in fact, that conservation officer can award that uh, kill permit for the black bear when that field is beginning to be harvested. Um, because to be honest, that's when um, it's probably easiest to um, take out the pest. So that's the, the story behind the bill and what the bill seeks to address. Thank you, Delegate. Are there questions for the patron? Delegate Ware. Delegate Weber, what's, what is the uh, reluctance to allow this today? Why is there a reluctance today? I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the code is not as prescriptive as it, as, it, as it could be. And I think de depending on the conservation officer, et cetera, they're, um, you know, they can be interpreted in different ways. And this provides clarity for that officer to say, yes, you can. Okay. I guess I would ask the same question of, of DGIF, Madam Chair. Yes, Madam Chair. I think a lot of the, the current reluctance comes from the fact that these permits are intended to prevent damage. And so as Delegate Weber is discussing where uh, the applications, and, and I don't know from personal experience the situations that, that you've become aware of, but what sounds like is happening is because they're being applied for during the harvest period, there's no longer a threat of additional damage um, at that point in time. Now, there would be for coming years, which I think is the problem that the delegate seeks to solve. But under existing code, when, when our folks would look at it and they say, okay, if you have an animal here, it's caused a problem, is there a threat of a continuing problem? The answer is no in the case of Delegate Weber's example because you're, you're cutting the corn this weekend, so it's all going to be gone. Um, I think his bill is, is seeking to allow a, a thinning of the herd, so to speak, for future years, if I understand it correctly. And uh, we have no position on, on the underlying measure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there other questions for the patron? Can I ask one? Uh, I have one. So it was, I guess I was wondering if this authorization that's currently in code in line 17 through 20, if that's not explicit, it says, if after investigation the director as his designee finds that the deer or bear are responsible for the damage, he shall authorize in writing the owner lease Lisey or any other person designated by the director is designated to kill such deer or bear when they are found upon the land upon which the damage occurred. So I was just wondering if that wasn't explicitly given, giving authorization that you're seeking in so the proposed bill. If what the, what the additional language seeks to incur is to say that while, so, so for instance, when you go into harvest a cornfield, um, depending on the size of that field, if you've got a couple hundred acres, you're going to be there for a while, um, and depending on the weather, et cetera. And so when you begin to take off the headlands, um, that's when you can really see the, dare, the, the damage there, and you actually have access to be able to, um, to eliminate the, the damage, the pest that's doing the damage. Um, and so you're, if you're going to be there a little bit, essentially what has occurred is that the the conservation officer is saying well you're harvesting 
so you can no longer eliminate that pest. Well, the problem that we have is that during the course of that, um, you know, a more more damage can be done while you're harvesting, depending on how big your fields are, et cetera. Some of our fields are, are hundreds of acres, um, and the other is that um, you know you've got you've got a population issue that has continuously continued to rise, um, and you know it while the harvest is. Our regular harvests are good, but we start harvesting corn in September. Thank you. Are, is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of the bill? Did you want to come up? Um, uh, first, I want to apologize. My name is Jordan Sneed. I have no clue what I'm doing. This is my very first time coming. Uh, the whole reason I'm here originally is for SB 1632, the hunting on Sundays, and I'm in favor of it. I just found out about it last night. Uh, but, yeah, I think that it would be a good call uh, because I, I'd, I'd love to bear hunt. I, I go up in the mountains. I bow hunt a lot, um, and I've seen what the bears will do. First they come down, they get the corn that's been cut, and now they're like, oh, hey, there's corn here, and they start working their way across the field. Next thing you know, they smell something from a nearby house. Now they're gonna move that way. Bears are opportunistic. And you give them an inch, they're gonna take a mile. So I think it would be great to help out the farmers if they were allowed the, the kill permit. Thank you, and thanks for coming to express your, uh, your uh, uh, priorities. That's really important, your voice, thank you. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak against uh, the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Molly Armis. I'm the Virginia State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, we feel it is a misstep to remove the discretion of DGIF by not only requiring them to authorize the killing of bears when they are found to be responsible for damaging crops, but to also prohibit the director from authorizing non-lethal control measures unless they are specifically requested by the owner or lessee of the land where the crop damage occurred. Farmers in Virginia already kill a large number of bears. Um, in 2017, when the DGIF proposed black bear population objective changes, they stated that it is not uncommon for a farmer to kill 20 to 30 bears using kiln permits on his or her property annually, um, especially in poor mass years when bears in higher numbers are drawn into cornfields. So this seems like an exceptionally high number already. Uh, the literature on the issue indicates that a number of non-lethal measures can be effective at preventing bear crop conflicts, um, including electric fencing, which was 100% efficacious in one study where the fence was properly installed and maintained. Other techniques to prevent crop raiding include planting crops that are not attractive to bears uh, in fields adjacent to forests, aversive conditioning using rubber buckshots, uh, noise-making devices, exploders, um, planting crops, or sorry, uh, protecting remaining broadleaf forest stands, as well as converting monospecific tree plantations to natural broadleaf forests. So uh, if passed, HB 963 would needlessly prohibit the use of these effective and humane alternatives unless the owner specifically requested them. Uh, we believe that landowners should be educated on humane conflict prevention, as well as the important e ecological role that bears play in the environment. Uh, in one study where landowners were educated on the ecological role of bears, farmers were more tolerant of crop losses caused by them. Um, more precisely, farmers gained tolerance for bears if they understood the importance of a mass failure, um, that bears had no other food and were hungry and needed food to survive winter hibernation. Uh, bears are also a slow-producing and long-lived species and are susceptible to overkill. Um, this is not merely hypothetical because by 1900, Virginia's black bears had been virtually extinguished for this very reason. Um, we feel it's time to get a better understanding of the population and trends in the state before allowing even more killing of these sentient Bruins. Uh, rather than escalating the high number of bears already killed in Virginia, people should be encouraged to adopt common sense behaviors so that Black bears can persist on our shared landscape for future generations. Um, this is the humane solution. Thank Great. you. Thank you. If there, there's no other, uh, Delegate Webert, do you want to share any last words? Well, um, 
in regards to the population of black bears, particularly in the region that we're talking about um, in the Piedmont, it has continued to, to rise and skyrocket. Um, in fact, you see uh, mamas with you know three or four footballs or cubs behind them, um, and they'd be they're becoming more and more of a nuisance. Otherwise, I wouldn't be bringing the bill forward. Um, in regards to some of the other um, matters, in order to try and keep black bears out, um, when you farm several thousand acres, electric wire fence is very cost prohibitive. Um, and depending on the market, you know, that the damage of corn can range anywhere from a few hundred dollars in one field to thousands in the next. Um, so I would just urge the body to, uh, to pass, uh, to please pass the legislation or, you know, do what the committee wishes. Thank you. Delegate Willett. Madam Chair, I just had one additional question, maybe directed back to the director of DGF, just making sure you're okay with the limitation on that discretion. I, I completely understand the delegate's concern with, with the, the bear infestation and, and the need to deal with that. My, my only concern is just on the discretion. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I, um, and again, we have no position on, on the underlying legislation, but the bill does still, it says, whenever the director is designated, he finds a bear responsible for damaging crops, which uh, to me is... is lingo that I'm accustomed to in other sections of, of this statute that say we have to make the initial finding that the damage has occurred. Um, so we retain discretion to issue or not issue permits. It's not simply a shell grant just because requested. And, and I would say that's key language for us to have and, and the primary concern of ours in any uh, amendment affecting this section. Thank you. The committee operates by motion. The clerk will open the roll. All those who wish to uh, vote in favor of this bill, uh, please do so. Weaver vote. All right, the, we'll close the roll. The vote is uh, three to five. The bill fails to move forward. Delegate Edmonds, um, you have two bills. Let us know which one you'd like to have go first. The elk bill is, I believe, Bill 388. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, House Bill 388 <clears throat> simply allows the Department of Game, Animal, and Fisheries to create a special license to hunt elk within the elk management zone, southwest Virginia. It also requires an application fee of $15 for residents and $20 for non-residents, as well as establishing a $40 license fee for residents and a $400 license fee for non-residents. And I, I'm sure that the Department would like to speak to this. Sure. Director? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. What, what this bill references is, is the elk herd that uh, the department has established in a three-county area in southwest Virginia, similar to efforts that were undertaken by Kentucky and West Virginia. Um, th that started with a herd of 75 introduced elk into Buchanan County. They've grown to currently about 200. So we're a few years away from an actual elk hunt um, being authorized out in that area. However, we have to go through regulatory processes to establish the license, the application procedures, the lottery process for awarding it, um, because these hunts actually, uh, in comparison to some of the others that we'll discuss in this committee, do generate significant revenues both for the department and for the localities that are involved, and so they operate a little bit differently. This bill simply would give us the authority to go ahead and, and start the regulatory process to set up the elk hunt for the time when the population reaches the uh, point that it's ready for it. Thank you. Are there questions for the patron? Um, Delegate Ed Edmonds, I just, and, and maybe the director can answer this, and this was the part, so I, I took a look at the, I think it was the elk management plan, and so can you confirm if the special license is just to hunt elk in the 
the designated elk management zone, or is it also to hunt elk outside of that zone, which I believe is comprised of Buchanan, Dickinson, and Wise County? That's right. Great question, and, and great job looking at our elk management plan, which is a very good document, by the way, and, and very lengthy, as you probably noticed, but for very thorough analysis of elk restoration efforts in Virginia. And this bill, the license would apply just to the three county area, the elk management zone, outside of that zone where elk herds are not uh, intended to be established. The current status quo would be continued, which is that elk would be permitted to be hunted on a deer license. Thank you. Delegate Edmonds can I ask a second question. Sure. Um, so I saw in your fee schedule, um, it seemed, you know, I think like, for example, I was looking at the fee schedule for the other special licenses. So for Bear, uh, it was, I think Bear was non-resident special license for Bears was 110. And so this this one, the proposal is a $400 fee. I just wanted to ask, um, you know, why there's such great dis, uh, differences between the various fee schedules. This one seems to be a lot higher. Well, that's, that's a great question. And I can just tell you as, as and, and I want the department to uh, also weigh in because they, they're the ones who set the fees. But I can tell you as a hunter, um, an elk is a significant trophy. And quite frankly, we don't have, and it probably compares to other states that offer elk tags as well. But I'm sure the department would like to. Yes, Madam Chair, the fees uh, mentioned in this, this bill um, actually match up very close to the state of Kentucky, which is where this area is near, and who already has an ongoing elk hunt. And so that's the basis of it. Another interesting point with um, the elk license versus other types of license is the primary revenue generator is actually the lottery system to apply for the hunt as opposed to the license itself. There tend to be few licenses authorized in many applications through the lottery. Um, so it's a little different. Great. Thank you. Are there any uh, folks in the audience who'd like to speak in support of the bill? Any who oppose who would like to speak? Move to second. Second. Uh, the motion is properly before us to move to report with the second. If you would like to support this bill, please vote yay. The clerk will close the roll. The bill passes seven to zero. Delegate Edmonds, you also have another bill, House Bill 1632. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, House Bill 1632 simply opens up the right to hunt on Sunday to public lands. Uh, if you remember, well, you may or may not, uh, several years ago, we passed Sunday hunting on private lands. More than 40 states allow some form of public land Sunday hunting and access is critical to recruiting the next generation of conservationists and Virginia sportsmen and women. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I need to preface that when this bill passed the first time, I not only voted against it, but I railed against it until uh, I started hunting on Sunday <laughs> and uh, after church. And, uh, well, maybe occasionally before, but I made it to church. If, I, if you want to make it to church, you'll make it to church. Uh, so anyway, um, it just seems to me that when hunters are paying, especially uh, on the wildlife management areas, are paying for those through license fees, and they're, um, they're the ones who are actually paying for the lands, it just seems hypocritical of us to not allow them to use those lands that they've oftentimes paid for. So. Thank you, Delegate. Are there any questions for the patron? Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak in support of this bill? I think there was a gentleman. Great. Please come on up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Cyrus Baird here with Safari Club International. We're a conservation and hunting advocacy group uh, worldwide, but I also live in Virginia and hunt in Virginia. Um, and I appreciate Delegate Edmonds bringing this legislation before this body. Um, as you heard him say, uh, this is an equal access and opportunity for all issue. Um, sports women, sportsmen and women in the Commonwealth uh, pay for the vast majority of the funding for the Department of Game and Fisheries, uh, the body that purchases and manages the WMAs where hunters recreate. Um, and they're the only user group that is currently prohibited from using that, those public lands on Sundays. Um, and just as a historical context, uh, this 
effort in legislation was supported by uh, Governor Northam, um, then State Senator Northam, um, and then Lieutenant Governor Northam. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's campaigned and championed on the backs of being a sportsman. Um, and so we see this as a, as a, as a very bipartisan effort. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this is also supported by the National Shooting Sports Foundation, Congressional Sports Foundation, the Wildlife Foundation of Virginia, and uh, several other conservation and hunting organizations. So, Great. Thank you. thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to speak in support of the bill? Come on up. Again, I'm sorry for my unorganization. Um, like I said, I work third shift, uh, so I'm very fortunate. I get to hunt pretty much any day of the week. Uh, I also am a landowner, so I get to hunt on Sundays as well. I also take full advantage of public land based off of hunting the wind. A lot of times I can't hunt my land. Um, I've met many people over the years that have completely given up hunting because of due to not being able to support their families off of just 40 hours or forced to work on su uh, Saturdays as well. Therefore... Sunday rolls around and they don't have private land, they cannot hunt. And so they've just completely given it up. I feel that it, this would not only m encourage more people to get outdoors and start increasing the license sales, um, it'll help continue our sport that we love so much on down the road. Uh, there's been a steady decline in license sales since the 80s, about 3% a year. Uh, some years it's been more. Uh, the introduction of the the apprentice license was great and has helped boost people uh, into hunting. But, um, yeah, I think that if it was opened up, there a lot of people that have given up hunting will then be able to go out and be able to hunt again since they do not have their own pu uh, private land to hunt. So thank you. And again. Thank you. Could you please repeat your name? Jordan Sneed. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan. Is there anybody in the audience who would wish to speak? Are you in support or opposed? All right. And to speak in opposition to the bill, please come on up. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Stephanie Kitchen with Virginia Farm Bureau. We have consistently opposed Sunday hunting over the years. For some of our members, this is simply a day of rest. For some of our members, this is the one day of the week where they can enjoy other outdoor recreational activities, particularly our horse owners, without worry from hunters. And I do want to clarify that we are not opposed to hunting. Many, if most, not all, of our members are hunters and sportsmen themselves. But um, as many as you know, Farm Bureau operates under a grassroots process, and this position has come from our members consistently over the years, and I think that speaks volumes to how much they do care about this issue. So thank you, and I hope that you oppose the bill. Thank you. Anybody else? Great. Doug, uh, Edmonds, do you have any last words? Uh, oh, sorry. Madam Chair. I'm, I'm, before we do, I'm sorry, there were two sorry. questions that pop up. Delegate yeah. Weaver. Um, I guess this is for, for Edmonds, uh, Delegate Edmonds. Uh, Delegate Edmonds, does this bill apply to all public lands, not just WMAs? Yes, sir, Delegate Weaver, it would apply to all public lands. Um, if I may, Madam Chair, yes, um, I would feel much more comfortable if this only applied to WMAs as opposed to like state parks, um, primarily simply because, uh, you know, some of our state parks during the fall can get pretty darned heavily um, populated with folks who are not hunting. Um, and so I'm not sure if we, if it would be, if he would, if the delegate would be amenable to a friendly amendment to just specify WMAs because I think WMAs are paid for with the fees that they that the hunters provide to correct yes sir uh, delegate yes yeah, sir um, I'm not sure that you can hunt state parks anyway unless it's by special do you permit Ryan could you clarify the state park yes madam chair the, the DCR allows hunting at select state parks under certain conditions so there are some that there's no hunting at all. There are others that, due to population concerns, they have special hunts, and there's others that have areas of the park that you can hunt during the hunting season generally and other areas that you can't. Now, I would say, and just like the private landowners, I believe any public landowner would, be, would, would have to authorize hunting the same as they do the other six days a week now 
Um, so, for instance, if there were certain department lands that we thought it was important that there wasn't Sunday hunting upon, we would retain the discretion to either open it on Sundays or not. I don't think the bill's mandatory on the public landowner. Further question, Madam Chair? Talk it, Weber. I guess this is for, for, for uh, VDGIF. So this bill, like, so I've got, you know, a WMA in my district that probably could use some thinning. They could authorize that, but then there's another in the southern end that, you know, we get a lot of leaf traffic, so to speak, then you would have the authority to say, we're not going to allow it on this particular piece of property. Yes, Madam Chair. And we do that now on heavily trafficked WMAs. We, we operate under only a quota system where there's only so many hunters so many days during the season just based on our, our population goals for that area. Um, and, and this wouldn't alter that. And, and to be clear, the, the uh, department doesn't have a position on this bill. Uh, I should remember always to say that, but it wouldn't. Uh, and the, the the legislation w we don't view as mandatory upon us as a public landowner to open all lands to Sunday hunting. It just would give us the ability to do what we do the other six days a week. For the question, Madam Chair, one more. Yes, sir. I'll get. So essentially, this could help with you managing some of these areas for the appropriate populations of wildlife, due to the fact that you can have folks in on certain areas on a Sunday. Uh, yeah, it would give us a seventh-day option in terms of what we're trying to do. Yes, sir. Delegate Ware. Thank you, Madam, Ch Madam Chair. Uh, also a question for Director. Um, what year was it we first uh, ap approved Sunday hunting? I think it's been about five years ago. I'd have to remember, uh, look back and look. 2014. Yeah, so five years ago, um, and and also maybe beneficial to the the subcommittee's deliberations. Um, since that time, we've monitored both population impacts and impacts to law enforcement as a result of Sunday hunting, and they really have been quite minimal. Um, there's been no negative population impacts, and in terms of a participation, um, it's been very similar to Monday through Friday. Um, a, a lot of the concern from from Law enforcement at the time that we authorized Sunday hunting is that it would be it would mimic Saturday in terms of numbers of calls of service, when in fact it's been more like a Monday or Tuesday. So the the impacts upon the agency and upon the resource have been not de detrimental. So follow up question. Sure, delegate Ware. One of the arguments that's frequently made on behalf of Sunday hunting is that we will see an uptick in licenses. What's been the trend line in the last five years on hunting licenses? Uh, hunting licenses continue to re remain stable to slightly down um, year to year. Uh, it's, and it's a, you know, obviously something that's of large concern to us has been pointed out in this meeting a number of times. That's our, our lifeline in terms of funding. Um, and really approaching license sales and trying to encourage new people to give hunting a chance um, is, is a multifaceted effort. There's, there's no one cure-all for it. There's a number of measures that help. This certainly would open up access to additional folks an additional day a week that they don't have now. And, and, and fairness to the bill, do I think it's, you know, any single measure is the cure-all to the hunting declines that we're seeing nationwide now? Uh, follow up on that. Yes. That's a long answer to the question, but I think the, gist, the, the answer to my question is that opening us up to Sunday hunting has not increased hunting license sales, and they continue to decline. Would that be fair to say? I think in general, yes, that'd be fair to say. Okay. Um, there may have been some some increase, uh, but uh, it hasn't changed the trend from downward to upward. By Thank itself. you. Great. Thank you. Delegate Edmonds, do you have final words? Uh, yes, ma'am. A couple things. One, um, our youth recruitment is probably the most important aspect of Sunday hunting because kids oftentimes don't be able to, aren't able to hunt. Uh, during the week because we're in school. My daughter's a perfect example of that. And uh, that's probably one of our most enjoyable times is we go to church, we eat lunch, and we go hunting that evening. And um, we have the luxury of hunting private land, so it's not an issue, but I know that there are a lot of other people who don't. And this would give, hopefully, give those parents a chance to spend some time with their kids uh, in the woods and hopefully maybe uptake these license sales at some point. We've got to do something. Uh, and secondly, in regards to, uh, to, to Farm Bureau's position, I'm uh, I certainly respect that. Uh, I'm a member of Farm Bureau, and I, we haven't been canvassed in, since this was uh, passed five years ago. So personally, my committee has not been. So I'm not sure that 
all the members recognize that uh, this issue is even before us. So. Thank you. Delegate Plum. Madam Chair, in memory of former chairman of this committee and apologies to the late uh, Vic Thomas, I move we report the bill. All right, the clerk will open the roll. Madam Chair. Oh, Delegate Ware. A few of us do remember Vic Thomas, and I'm sure he would be very disappointed with you, Delegate Plum. Uh, <clears throat> probably that's a slight understatement. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that have been offered for Sunday hunting. Um, many of them have proven to be false hopes across time. I think it does continue the uh, a lamentable practice, and that is movement toward commercialization of hunting. Um, I think that other folks who uh, enjoy the outdoors uh, appreciate having one day a week where they can uh, be in the outdoors. I hear from uh, both the Farm Bureau folks, folks uh, who ride horseback, others who enjoy the outdoors, and they like having one day during hunting season where it is, uh, those lands are accessible. Um, and I think for a lot of years, many hunters, uh, people that I talk to, have, have accepted it as kind of a... Uh, an accommodation of other folks who like to be outdoors. So I'm, for that, those reasons and for the memory of uh, Vic Thomas, I will be not voting to, uh, for it, this bill. Thank you, Delegate Ware. All right, the clerk will open the roll. If you support this bill, please vote yay. The clerk will close the roll. The bill passes four to two. And I think that we've completed our agenda for this morning. Delegate Fowler isn't here yet, and so we will adjourn our first meeting of the 2020 session. Thank you. So exciting. <laughs>